Yeah, so I guess, uh, yeah, let's let's start starting again. Um, so the next portion of the interactive lecture lab, whatever you want to call it, um, is basically me giving you the essentials of D3 so that you can actually create your own charts for the project. Um, so I wanted to put these up here. So these are most all of the functions you'll probably need to do the project. Um, and I linked to the D3 documentation that corresponds to each of these. Um, I also wrote on the board what we might still need. Um, so we talked about just selectors from what we've seen. Um, what we've seen of selectors is pretty much all we need to know about selectors for now. Um, we can select elements based on class and ID. Um, we haven't talked about scales yet, so that's the, the next point that I'll, I'll talk about. Um, we haven't talked about data, so how do we actually draw these things and manipulate our HTML page with um, data? And then accessor functions. So I mentioned accessor functions. Um, also, the other thing that if we have time, we'll, we'll get to is how to handle events. So how to handle hover and mouse click and, and stuff. Um, so that's kind of the, the goal um, of what we will know at the end of this lecture. And these things, again, I say three plus one components now. These things are all you need to actually create most types of charts. So understanding these, uh, the, the fundamentals is going to go um, a long way. And questions on what we just saw with selectors and the mutators before we, we dive into this next section, I'm actually going to show what we're going to get to. Um, so this is our goal. Um, it doesn't look like much, uh, but this is a scatter plot. There is some data behind it. Our circles have different colors, and we can hover over them, and it changes them to red. Um, so again, the uh, the beautiful but also frustrating thing about D3 is that to get four circles on the screen at certain positions that have hover interaction has this like kind of steep learning curve for D3. But once you understand how to draw four circles with hover, it's trivial to extend it to a thousand circles from a CSV. So getting something that's a trivial example is very non-trivial in D3, but once you understand these building blocks, um, most most everything else is easy and possible in, in D3. Um, so this is what we're trying to get to, this um, kind of toy example of a scatter plot. It doesn't have axes, it doesn't have a, um, a title, it doesn't have a legend, but um, we can build those things once we understand how to build this. Um, my D3 from the ground up. So um, basically going through and building this up from scratch so that hopefully we understand each of the, the components in its context. Um, this. Oh, yes. Um, so it is always a template. This is actually what JSBin gives us. Um, but um, the essential elements of what you need on a page for it to actually be a page. Um, so there's this doc type, which is just boilerplate you need. Sometimes you can tell the page that you want to use an older version of HTML. Um, if you just write HTML, it uses the most common specification, HTML5. Um, Everything always has to go in between HTML tags. And that tells you what part is the actual HTML page and what part is not. And then the head corresponds to 
things that don't visually need to show up on the page. So notice here that there's these tags that are just labeled meta. So these are metadata about the page. It tells us things like the device, the viewport, the character set. You can also do like a title tag. So again, the title tag, let's see if it shows up here. So the title tag is what shows up in the top tab. So uh, I have too many tabs, but um, getting to one tab. So my page is the title. It shows up in the tab. It shows up when we hover, but it doesn't visually show up on the page at all here. Um, and then the last element is the body. So usually you have a body, a head inside of an HTML. And if we want to use any JavaScript, uh, we can either reference a URL that's hosted on another server. So in this case, we're actually using a hosted version of D3 that has this HTTPS um, URL. And it basically makes this external request to Cloudflare and it loads the library. But we could have, um, and we can, if we have a local library, um, load it with just the path to the file. So sometimes you might see this on someone else's example where it just loads D3 from the current directory. Um, oh, so this is the template that JSBin um, creates. Oh, um, yeah, so if you go to add library, um, anytime you click one of these, it actually just generates the appropriate script. So usually, it's such an insignificant difference in speed. Um, I will say the places where local versus hosted become apparent, um, if you don't have an internet connection, um, this needs an internet connection to load it over HTTPS. Um, so if someone who has your code wants to run it locally, um, I've been on planes and I've not been able to access my visualizations just because I linked to HTTP URLs and I didn't have Wi-Fi. Um, so if you don't have internet, this is probably better. If you do have internet, um, I usually recommend doing the um, hosted version just because this runs anywhere and it's all self-contained in the HTML. So if you were sending your visualization to someone else, you would also need to send the D3 library with its correct path for it to properly load. But with this script, all I need to do to share this is just share the HTML and the library automatically gets loaded here. Any other questions on the setup? All right, so step one of D3 and um, using data with D3. So something that um, I guess there's there's two different styles of D3 format layout that you might see. Um, I'm actually going to be using probably the more common one, and it will become apparent what I mean by this. Um, the kind of accepted just best programming style with D3 is to write all of your visualization code in a self-contained function and then call it later in the body of your page. So in here, I'm actually um, writing all of my code in the head in a script tag. And I'm just going to create a function um, that's called draw. And that draw function is going to take a single argument called data. And again, these don't have to be called draw and it doesn't have to be called data, but these are our common conventions. Um, 
the syntax I'm using for creating this function is a little bit strange, um, but one of the better ways to write functions. So instead of actually doing like in Python, you have things where you say like def draw, and this signals to Python to both create a variable named draw and assign the function that we're defining to that variable. But in JavaScript, it does some strange things with how its variables are scoped. So um, to run into less surprises, you explicitly assign a variable to an anonymous function. So this function is like a lambda. Um, and this is the equivalent, if we were in Python, to saying something like draw equals lambda data type thing. So in Python, you never, I've never seen someone define a function like this, but you equally could define a function using these lambdas in Python. Um, but in JavaScript, it's actually the norm is to define variables and assign an unnamed function to them rather than define a named function to start. And the reason I'm, I'm defining it in this way with data as an argument, um, so D3 is, I would say, declarative, but also functional in how you think about it, where everything is a function and everything gets passed as input to a function and you give output as what you want to do with that input. Um, so in this case, even though we're not passing in external data at this point, we might later down the line in this type of paradigm want to pass in external data. So this is our first step in the separation of data from aesthetic. Um, so in this case, data is always the argument. It's always the variable we pass into our draw function. And our draw function does all of the aesthetics. This is our data argument, and this is our draw function. And let's assume that we have some data already in here. And let's assume that this data has some type of properties and column names, which we'll get to um, when we need to use them. Um, but the First thing I wanted to talk about, uh, talking about what we still need, is actually this idea of scales. Uh, and all that scales are going to do in our case is Is do what we've always been trying to do in this class. Um, so scales are most simply a way to go from numbers to people. And why? Why might we need to go from numbers to pixels? Why can't I just say, um, let's actually make this less abstract and actually create some fake data.
So let's say, for example, we have housing price data. We have the median uh, rent in San Francisco for each neighborhood. And we have, let's say, 10,000. And in here, let's say we have um, neighborhood just as this um, NEI. And then let's say we also have um, something like number of bedrooms. And in here, So a three bedroom apartment in Soma is $10,000 a month, which probably isn't too far off scarily. Um, but let's say 4,500 is the median for the entire city. And let's just say this is like the mission. And the cheapest, let's say, is in the sunset or living on the beach. And we have bedrooms. Um, one. So here is our data. We have a continuous value. We have this categorical value. And then we have this ordinal value here. Uh, so for the sake of argument, we're going to say that this um, Bedrooms is actually discrete, but that it has this natural order to it. Um, why can't we um, just visualize these numbers directly on the page? Why do we need to make a conversion from numbers to pieces? I guess, so we don't necessarily, we don't care that this represents price. We just have the number of 10,000. Um, why can't we just say D3, draw circle here based on number 10,000? Where would be 10,000? Why can't I just say draw at position 10,000? Let's say x axis. Let's say draw circle at position 10,000 on the x position of our web page. I guess more, <laughs> it's an easier problem, I guess. Or it's, it's going to be a much more apparent problem. So it's not that there is an axis defined. We just saw that we were playing around with margins. Um, so there is a coordinate system. In the web browser, it's actually inverted coordinate system. So we have 0, 0 at the top, going down on the y-axis. We increase and going right on the x-axis. So there is some position here at like 10,000. Why is this a problem of saying draw at position 10,000? Yes, it most likely is going to be off the screen. For a context, um, this is like a, a retina screen. It has, I think, like 2,400 pixels. So most Visualizations, most screens, you usually assume a maximum of like maybe 1400 if you assume people have pretty like high def screens. If they don't have high def screens, usually like 960 is like the safest number. 
but conceptually, the reason we need scales is that pixels are a very different domain than data that we might need to visualize. Um, so pixels go from zero to let's say 1400, let's say on the Y it goes to like 800. Um, but we potentially might have price data, we might have things like SOMA, how do we visualize SOMA on our web page? That's an even harder, more cumbersome thing to visualize. Um, and, and, and then the, the bedrooms. Um, so the scales from a fundamental perspective are going to be the way we go from numbers to pixels. And in D3, we do the numbers to pixels conversion with a magical function in D3. There is this uh, there's a bunch of modules in D3 that are basically defined off of the main D3 function and they're all like really sensibly named. So in this case, we have gotten far enough in our analysis. We have some data now. We could start mutating things on the page. We could start drawing circles. Um, but the first thing we need to do is figure out where to actually draw these. And to figure out where to actually draw them, we need to go from numbers to pixels. And And the way to do this in D3 is we're just going to need to tell it how to convert in terms of max and min of numbers to max and min of pixels. Um, and the, the very like um, hand-coded artisanal way to do this is to actually just look at our data itself. Um, usually you always want to write your code in a general enough way that if you swap out your data, it still works. So every time I'm sitting down and I'm writing D3, if I'm writing a new line of code, I always think to myself, if I totally swap out this data for a new data variable, will my chart still draw? Um, to start, we're actually gonna hard code things. Um, and the first part of going from numbers to pixels is the what D3 calls domain and range of, of this function. Um, and domain is thought of as the input, range is thought of as the output. And D3 runs a magic conversion from input to output for us. We had to do this visually. So what D3 is going to do for us is it's going to allow us to, let's say here we're going from, let's say we start at 1,000. So there's no apartments in San Francisco less than $1,000 a month. And we go up to, let's say we want some like a little bit of buffer, maybe in like Russian Hill, it's $15,000 um, a month. So. We give our domain as this array of the start and the end. So it's a minimum value of 1,000, a maximum value of 15,000. 
and then the range is the pixels. Um, so again, we could say, figure out the device that the user is on and how wide and tall their screen is. We can make it like super responsive, but usually we just make some assumptions and we say it goes from zero to 960 for the X. And then for the Y, um, we actually go with this inverted scale. So we actually can specify a domain, let's say, um, actually let's switch this. Let's say our Y is gonna be our price and let's say our X is actually gonna be the number of bedrooms. So we can have zero being a studio and we can have four bedrooms. So the X is gonna be the number of bedrooms. The Y is gonna be the price. And again, for the Y, since it's an inverted Y axis in the web page, we actually put the maximum pixel value first. So 800 corresponds to uh, the minimum. So a minimum value of 1000 corresponds to a pixel value of 800, which is gonna be the bottom of our page. And then the max price of 15,000 corresponds to a pixel value of zero, which is the top of our chart. Um, so the left Yeah, and that's something that we can't change. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so anything that comes after D3 dot is usually a specifically named function. Other things like we made the data variable name for our argument, that could be something totally different. Can you say something? Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in this, uh, so this visual example here, so the domain is the potential input space. So for our price data, um, the potential possible values of price are somewhere between 1,000 and 15,000. And we want to represent those in pixels, but we want the difference in pixels to be proportional to the difference in price, if that makes sense. So the difference between 1,000 and 2,000 should be proportional when we visualize on the page um, in the difference of pixels. And what D3 does is it takes this input range for let's say a value um, here at let's say 14,000. It maps 14,000 to let's say our range of like 700 and it goes from maybe 10,000 to something lower at like 500. So it always makes sure that the difference between two points in the input domain compared to the total length of the input domain is proportional to the difference between the pixels when it actually visualizes them and the range of the space. And to see that in, in the code here, um, we can actually open the console.
Somewhere there's, can anyone see a syntax error, unexpected string? Many eyes is better than one pair of eyes. Ah, uh, there we go. Oh, sorry about that. The uh, <laughs> live reload did not work as live as I imagined. All right, so um, with scales, the thing on how to use them is you basically use them like any other function, they are any other function, and you just pass in the argument that you want to scale, and as output, it gives you a appropriate number of pixels. Um, so notice here, um, console log, just so that we can actually see the output here. And as input, we are giving the y function, so when we say d3.scale linear, we set up its domain and its range properties. That creates this function in d3, which we save in a variable y. So from here forward, we can actually say, I want to figure out how many pixels 2,000 should be drawn to the page with. Um, so if we pass in 2,000, it gives us 742. Um, if we pass in 15,000, it gives us zero, which makes sense. Um, this value of the domain gets mapped to the corresponding value in the range. 
And if we give it a Y of zero or 1000, it maps to 800. So So there's a few like parameters that you can tell D3 what to do with it. Usually, if you don't specify, it scales it appropriately um, past it. So here it gives us negative 171, which actually, now this did a weird thing. I think it like wraps it around. Well, uh, oh yeah, yeah. So um, there's an argument, I forget what it's called, but it basically does like clipping where it puts any value outside of the range to either the max or the minimum. So if you do want to clip it, you can clip 18,000 to zero. Can you do it? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a easy flag to make, but I'm sure there's some way that you can work with the scale or have two scales and, and make it work with a wraparound. Yes, so there's a lot of, I guess, assumptions that you have to make with D3. So this actually gets back to the like confusing thing and kind of magical thing about how D3 works. Um, so this is a JavaScript function that the creator of D3 wrote that actually creates and returns another JavaScript function. So this can be thought of as like a template or like a macro almost. So when we say D3.scale linear domain and range, we're just creating, we're saying, I want to create a function with these parameters set up in terms of how it does its scaling. And we just have to know that anything in the scale usually creates an argument that takes a single function. And to actually, uh, to actually get to the bottom of what and how it actually creates this. Um, the documentation's usually like incredibly thorough on the on the um, the site. So in this case, if we go to we search D three scale, we got to the wiki page of quantitative scales. Um, <laughs> and we can see here um, D three dot scale linear gives us a um, little documentation. Usually there's an example. Uh, this one doesn't actually have an example for the, the basic use case. But it basically says, constructs a scale with this range and um, domain. And then it creates this function that you can pass things into. Pattern. Yeah, so there are patterns. Um, it's actually probably the most like consistent API, but it's a little bit, the patterns are very complex. So usually for a long time, it's just gonna seem and feel like it's very ad hoc. And usually I say, use your best guess. Um, things like a scale, you don't, I'm sure you can intuit some reason to have multiple arguments, but usually with a scale, if you're thinking about like, I want to go from input to output, you think in terms of like a single number that you're transforming here. Um, and usually like 
what you would probably want it to do, it tends to do. Um, and for things where you're going to be changing the X and Y position of circles, that's something where we'll see in a second. We're just going to call the like X position function, and then that's going to change the X position of all the circles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's where the Chrome console comes in. Um, so the downside to using like JS bin, um, it's great for live demos and stuff. Um, it doesn't really have its own built in autocomplete. So going back here, let's see, is D3 on the page? D3 is not defined. But in here, usually I, I just use the console to explore all of the, oh. To explore all the functions. So if I have something like bar y equals d3 dot scale dot linear dot uh, actually that's all we really need. Go here, we can pick up d3. Yeah, so again it's just one big JavaScript function. We have D3 now. Mm -hmm. Going back here, if we have something like bar y equals D3 dot uh, scale dot linear, we can then say y dot, and that's going to give us uh, clamping is the thing where it pushes all the out of range values to the min and the max. Um, so you can clamp it, you can do domain, um, you can set the ticks, but the thing that this autocomplete gives you is all of the JavaScript functions as well. So since this variable y is a D3 object and function, it's also a JavaScript object and function. So we have things like property is enumerable, we have prototype, we have two string. Um, so the best way actually to figure out how to work with it is I usually go to examples um, and I guess now is a good time as ever to talk about um, Mike Bostock's site. Um, so this is by far probably the quickest and best way to learn D3 um, and it's basically this site that Mike Bostock, the creator of D3, made almost purely for the purpose of needing an easy way to visualize examples he's created in D3. It had this crazy growth of just like popularity of other people using it for their own, even though he didn't create it for the purpose of like publicizing D3. He just wanted an easy tool for himself, um, I believe. And in here, the nice thing about blocks that we're gonna use extensively through the class is that it actually renders visualizations in our web page, and we can write a readme of text, and we can also put in a file that has D3 code and host it all as a gist. So this is actually a gist. If we go on the look, like little ID link, 
it um, it takes us back to the gist with the raw code, but gists don't yet render visualizations. Um, so the blocks site is an example or is a place to visualize your examples in a, in a pretty easy way. And in, in most of Mike Bostock's um, posts, he actually lists the functions that he uses, which is probably a much better way to learn how to use them. So if you have a question on something like um, D3 scales, I usually search for D3 scales and then um, like blocks. And the first one that comes up is a bar chart. The second one that comes up is a line chart. So if I wanna see what I can do with the scale, I usually click on an example. Mike is always great and he lists all of the functions that you might need. And then at the bottom, you can see the code to create the line chart and you can see how he actually creates his scales and how he actually uses them in the context of a, a larger visualization. Um, so that, that would be my recommendation if you want a quick and easy way um, to figure out how to use the advanced functions here. Other, uh, other scale questions. Um, so again, scales are simply a function that map from an input data domain to an output pixel range. They're gonna let us, this is basically like the heavy lifting of the library. It gives us this functionality to convert from our data domain to this output range of pixels and not have to think about it every time. Um, And with this, we can actually do powerful things like actually draw some circles on the page. Uh, 